Okay, in this podcast, I'm going to go through all of the stuff that's listed on this screen, formulas, conversions, stoic solutions, and how to write net ionic equations. So let me just get this uh, all set up. All right, so first of all, just from a classification of matter standpoint, don't ex- really see a lot of questions being asked about this, but you've got pure substances, which include elements and compounds, and then impure substances, which are mixtures. You could be asked, Um, about separating mixtures. So you can do use separation, um, do separation mechanically where you actually physically will pick things out if they're big enough. You could use a magnet to separate things, okay? You could uh, also filter. So the assumption is that you have something solid that gets stuck in the filter. Paper and the filtrate, you should know these terms, goes through and gets collected in the beaker, but usually you're interested in what's on the filter paper and massing that, but not always. Distillation also could be asked about. So the idea of distillation is you are separating things based on differences in boiling point. So you have two liquids in here, let's say. You heat them up, and one of the liquids has a lower um, boiling point, so it boils first, and it comes up, and the, you have this distillation apparatus set up so that it gets cooled and then that condenses it back into a liquid so you can actually collect the higher boiling sample that comes off. So if you're looking at um, a question about how to separate two liquids, um, any of these separations are always based on some physical property difference. And in this case, the difference here is boiling, po- boiling points. Um, I don't generally teach chromatography, but there was actually a question that referred to chromatography on last year's exam, so I thought I probably should mention it. So think about the typical paper chromatography where you have an ink spot on a piece of paper. could be something as simple like as a coffee filter, and you put it in water, just the tip of it, and then what you have is you have this um, water by capillary action moves up and you end up separating the colors of the ink. Okay, so if we look at what happens, um, there's actually a calculation you can do that looks at this, what's called the RF value. And what you're looking at is the difference. So we have two phases. We have a stationary phase, which is the paper, and we have a mobile phase, which is the solvent. In the case of what we were just talking about, the mobile phase, the solvent would be water, and the um, filter paper would be the, the stationary phase. And the distance that the, sub, the spot moves depends on the affinity or the adsorption it has for the paper versus the... Um, how well it is um, attracted to the solvent. Depends on the IMF of the solvent. So if something is uh, has a lot of attraction for the paper, it's not going to move very far. So you can actually do an RF calculation where you can compare two different substances. You can look at how far the, let's say, the color and the ink moved versus how far the whole solvent line moved. And in this case, it would be the solvent went up to here, but I made a a drop of let's say green ink here. So this is 4.8 centimeters and I divide it by 5.6. Now I don't know that you'd have to calculate, you didn't have to calculate it on this last year's question, but if you're given two samples and you want to compare and you're asked to compare them based on RF, uh, the larger the RF, the further the sample moved. So the less attraction it had for the stationary phase, okay, and the more likely it was going to stay in the mobile phase. Okay. Um, luckily for some of you, there is not a lot of nomenclature on the uh, AP exam. Most of the formulas will be given to you. Now, one of the things I do suggest is as soon as you get into the AP exam and you open up your book, uh, and unfortunately, periodic table, you can't be pulled out, but I would do this plus one, plus two, plus three, minus one, minus two, sorry my writing is so bad, I'm using a mouse, minus three. And the other thing I would do is I'd say this is 
period one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And what you should know is that anything in this group is going to have a make an ion that's a plus one charge, plus two, plus three, minus one, minus two, minus three. And then if you could ask any um, electron configurations, you have your period numbers all set here to go. So most formulas will be given you, uh, given to you, but if you are asked, for instance, you might be asked something like this, where you have, you're given that you have sodium phosphate, you're given the formula, and magnesium chlorate. And you may not remember your charges on your polyatomic ions, but you can figure them out based on what you have here. So this is a plus one, and there's three of them, so this is a plus three, and there's one of these phosphates, so its charge must be minus three to make it neutral. Just like you know magnesium is a plus two, and there's two chlorates, so this must, each of these must have a minus one. So if you're asked to write the products, the sodium is going to end up with the chlorate, and the sodium we know is a plus one, and we've just determined that the chlorate is a minus one, so that's balanced. And the magnesium is going to end up with a phosphate. Now the magnesium's a plus two, the phosphate's a minus three, so I'm going to have three of those. Just do the crisscross and end up with two of those. Okay. You might get asked about uh, which formulas um, in, a, in a list have both ionic and covalent bonding, and what you're looking for there. Of course, ionic, they start with a, with a cation. And that's usually a metal, but it could also be ammonium. And a covalent compound starts with a non-metal. Um, so uh, things that start with an ion, there's only, well, there's a few things here that could be ionic. I'm sorry, my, my mess. If you're looking for something that's both ionic and covalent, it's always going to be something that has a polyatomic ion in it. Because if you think about the sulfate, you know, it's, its structure is something like this with ionic, I'm sorry, with uh, covalent bonds. And, and then you're going to have the sodium plus. So this is the negative ion and a positive ion. These are covalent bonds, and this is an ionic bond. Okay, so anything that has both is going to have um, a polyatomic ion in it. Here's the same thing about classify as a molecular compound. So over here we're looking at something that starts with a non-metal. So certainly carbon is a non-metal, so that would be molecular. Um, so we're looking for which one is not. Both of these start with nitrogen, but you've got to recognize that ammonium is an ion. It's a positive ion, a cation. So that would not be molecular. So the answer would be D. You might get a question like this, uh, which sample represents the greatest number of moles? So you do a quick check. This is about the molar mass of CO2. This is one mole. This is one mole. This is Avogadro's number, so this is one mole. We all know that the molar mass of water is this, so that's about one mole. So the answer is going to be E. They're all the same. You might get asked, uh, which has the no largest number of molecules? So we're going to be looking for the thing that has the largest number of moles. So I just do a quick check. I do my A is going to be 10 over the molar mass of this, which is going to be about uh, 16. And I compare it to something that's heavy, and that's going to be 10. Xenon is 131. So this is going to be the highest number of moles, the thing with the lowest molar mass. If it has the highest number of moles, it has the highest number of molecules. Um, you might be asked the largest percent mass for a specific element. So here we have hydrogen. And so there's four mass of 4 over total mass of 16. This is going to be a mass of 6 over a mass of 24 plus 6, that's 30. This is going to be 2 over 18. This would be 2 over 34. Okay. So um, let's think about how we uh, simplify this. So 2 thirty-fourths is not is going to be the uh, very, very small. Let um, me see. 2 eighteenths is going to be uh, 4 36. So it's not going to be this. This is too small. So this is about 1 fourth. And this is smaller than one fourth, so the answer is going to be this. Just quick kind of mental math stuff. Same thing here: 25. Calculate the number of carbon atoms in 25 grams. 
Now let's see what we have here for choices. It's always good when you have these mental math problems to take a look at what your choices are. So you know you're going to have something, you know, approaching a mole. So this is not enough atoms. We need something around Avogadro's number. This is um, a little less than a mole. This is a little more than a mole. And this is a negative exponent. It doesn't make any sense, right? So if I have 25 grams as a question is, is it one mole or two moles? I mean, is it greater or less than one mole? Well, here I have three carbons times 12, that's 36. So I know I have more than one mole, so it's going to be that. I don't have to get any more precise than that on a multiple choice. All right, just some terminology here. Um, uh, two compounds that have the same molecular formula, in this case CH260, C2H6O, in different structural formulas is called an isomer. So if you rearrange this, um, these atoms different ways, you get completely different molecules in terms of uh, properties. So they are isomers, same molecular formula, different structural formula. Okay, They're different compounds. The empirical formula, as I'm sure you recall, is the simplest whole number ratio of atoms in a compound or molecule. Um, and you can have different substances that have the same empirical formula that are actually different substances, different molecular formulas. An ionic compound that contains water molecules embedded in its structure is known as a hydrate. And a version of the ionic compound with the water removed is anhydrous. An means without water. Common name, common uh, chemist used for ionic compound is salt. It's just a synonym. Okay. Okay. So um, one of the common question, types of questions on the test is uh, determining an empirical formula. And so what you're looking for for each of your compounds, I mean for each of your elements, is to figure out the ratio of moles because the formula is the subscripts in the formula are the um, ratio of moles. Okay, so the way you would do that is you'd figure out how many, um, take your grams and figure out how many moles of each substance you have. These numbers have to be um, simplified. The easiest way to do that is divide them all by the smallest, which would be 0.728. And when I do that, I get about 7, 7, 1, and 2. So my formula is going to be C7H7N1O2. Okay, it's also very common to have questions about um, a hydrate where you're told you're given a sample, you heat it up to get rid of the water. This is your mass of your dried or, or your anhydrous sample. We want to know the formula of the hydrate. So what you're trying to figure out is the moles of water compared to the moles of the dried compound, right? So first you've got to figure out how many grams of moles you have. Then you figure out how many moles that is. You do the same thing for the compound that's dried, the dried compound. And then you've got to figure out what the mole ratio of the two is. So divide them both by the smallest of the two. In this case, we come out with five. So that means there's five moles of water for every one mole of magnesium carbonate. OK, so let's just go back. For stoichiometry, you have to think about all the ways that you can go from moles to other units. Um, if, certainly, if you're using atoms, molecules, any things, it's Avogadro's number. Moles to grams is formula mass. If you're using dealing with a solution, the, the key thing is that molarity is moles per liter. So you've got to use that. If you're going between moles and volume of a gas, if you're at STP, it's pretty easy with 22.4 liters. If you're not at STP, you have to use PIVNERT. Okay. So um, most problems are, um, on the AP test are going to be limiting reactant problems of their straight stoic. So I like to suggest that you do a, an ICF table, which should be pretty easy now for all of you that maybe struggled with it before now that you've done equilibrium ICF tables. And you don't have to fill this whole thing out, but I want to think about an uh, important thing in ICF tables. I, I'm using moles. Some people call this a BCA before, change, and after. 
if I have one gram of lithium hydroxide, uh, so lithium hydroxide, let me just get to where I did some of these calculations. And let me see, sorry. So um, I calculate the moles offline. So one gram divided by molar mass, mass which is 23.95 grams. And I come out with point, about 0 0.04. And I carry extra sig figs if I have them here. And then uh, carbon dioxide, it's going to be 0.225 liters. And because it's STP, I know 22.4 liters is one mole. So that's going to give me just a little bit uh, less than 0 0.010 moles. So just doing a quick check here, that means I'm going to use 0 0.01 of this. That's going to be limiting for me. And if I, I got to first look at the balance equation. Good point. I got a, one carbon there, one carbon. I've got two of these. So we have two lithium, two lithium, one carbon, four waters, four waters. Okay. So I need twice as much of this, so I'm going to need minus 0 0.0 to use 0 0.02 of that, okay? So then the question is, how much lithium carbonate can I make? How much of this can I make? I'm going to make the same number of moles, because for every one mole of this, I get one mole of this. So I'm going to make 0 0.01 moles of lithium carbonate. I can multiply that times its molar mass, um, which is 73.89 grams is one mole and I get 0.739 grams. Okay. Um, in the new version of the test, you also get a lot of questions that are limiting reaction problems um, based on particle diagrams. So if I want to know what's limiting reaction, first I got to get clear about what the balanced reaction is. So if I'm H2 plus O2 and I'm making water, I'm going to need two of those and two of those. So the way I do these is I know I have 10 H2s and 7 O2s, so I have more whites than I do have red. So I'm going to say I need two H2s and one O2 to make a water. Whoops, didn't mean to do that. Sorry. Um, to make a water, so I'm going to keep doing that until I run out. 2H2 and an O2, 2H2 and an O2, 2H2 and an O2, 2H2 and an O2, and I'm left over with two O2s. Okay, so limiting reactant was my H2. I have excess O2. All right, when I have one gram of lithium hydroxide reacting with 0.225 liters, and I make 0.369 grams. So this is the same problem I just worked on. And so if I have 0.369 grams is what I, I made. So this is actual over theoretical times 100 is my percent yield. That's going to be 0.369 over what I should have made was 0.73 something, right? Times 100. And this is going to be, you know, if I'm doing this as multiple choice, and this looks like about 50%. I can use a calculator and get more precise than that if it's free response, but about a 50% yield. All right, so let's talk about dissociation. So if I have an ionic compound and I'm dissolving it, I have this um, crystal lattice ionic structure, very, very strong, where I have positive and negatives alternating in a nice, neat rows and columns. And when I dissolve this, it solvates them. Sometimes we use a term we call this solvation, not salvation solvation or hydration okay so let's take a look at the process the energy of dissolving involves three steps one two three the first thing that has to happen that requires an energy input is I have to break this very strong attraction between positive and negative ions it takes a lot of energy to do that as you know water is quite um, has hydrogen bonding and that's very strong, so I need an energy, whoops. I need an energy input to break the hydrogen bonds between the waters. So the question is, why does stuff dissolve if it's not energetically favorable? Well, it turns out the strongest um, step is 
the exothermic step, these would be endo, the exothermic step is the formation of ion dipoles, the ion from the, either the Cl- or the Na+, with the dipole on the water. Those are very strong, and when those come together, uh, energy gets released. Okay, so you've got to break attractions in both the ionic compound. You've got to break the IMF attraction, which is the intermolecular force, right? The hydrogen bonding. It's not a hydrogen-oxygen bond. And then I form the ion dipole. Now, when you're drawing your waters that hydrate, one mistake you want to avoid is you don't want to do this and say that the water has a positive, a positive, and a negative. Either you draw it simply as the Mickey, or you can say this side is more positive, this side is more negative. It's not a full positive and negative. It is not an ionic compound. Okay, so let's take a look at a typical problem you might have. So if you're asked to draw particle diagrams, and in every exam, since a new curriculum, we've been students have been asked to do this. So you want to draw it as a solid. So as a solid, I have one magnesium for every two chloride. And they're also might be looking for you to identify that magnesium is a much larger ion than a chlorine. Remember, as we go across the row and Zeph increases, that I am um, getting smaller. So my magnesium is going to be large. That's going to be a two plus. And I'm going to have two chlorine for every one of those. Right? So thing about ionic compounds are nice neat rows and, and columns of these of these ions right so whatever you draw you want to make sure that you have um, twice as many chloride minuses those are the minuses to the two plus on the magnesium and that in this case the magnesium is larger for the water you want to indicate that you have hydrogen bonding, so there's this attraction. Hydrogen bonding is usually shown as dashed lines between the waters, right? Okay, and then when you have it dissolved, uh, my suggestion is you draw the uh, plus two magnesium. You draw the water around it, and I would suggest you draw three waters, showing it as a hydration shell, and then you have uh, two chloride minuses, and those are going to have the water, the, the hydrogen part of the water closest to it, um, forming the hydration shell, okay? So if you're asked to draw the diagram, this is what I would do. You'd probably be drawing it neater, but that's okay. You might be asked, especially on an FRQ, to, to write the equation for the disassociation of these solids. So if I were to put this in water, and it's soluble, which it is, because potassium is always soluble. I get two potassium one ions that are aqueous, and I get one S2 minus ion, which is aqueous. When I put this in water, I have a nickel ion, and I have the nitrate ion. This is, so I end up with nickel two plus, which is aqueous, and I have two of the nitrate minus aqueous. So don't break apart the, the nitrate. That's a one ion. Okay. Let's talk about electrolytes and non-electrolytes. Um, so if I have charged particles that are mobile, they can uh, conduct electricity because if I put a positive electrode here and a negative electrode here, the positives move this way, the negatives move this way, and the movement of charged particles is electricity. Okay, so in order for things to be conduct electricity, they have to be both um, charged and they have to be mobile. And so dissolved ionic compounds are um, electrolytes. So electrolyte is any substance that dissociates into ions when it's dissolved in water. A non-electrolyte may dissolve in water, but it does not dissociate. So any molecules, any molecules, it will dissolve It'll break apart into this sugar molecule and that sugar molecule into individual molecules, but it will not form ions and therefore does not conduct electricity. 
Okay, so let's take a look at what all that means. So if I have a strong electrolyte, which means it comes apart into ions completely, 100%, 100%, um, I have a strong electrolyte and I get very uh, bright light. I conduct the most electricity, okay? If I don't have any ions, I have a non-electrolyte. If I have something that only partially ionizes, let's say, you know, 5%, 10%, um, I have a weak electrolyte that conducts electricity, but not as much as a strong electrolyte. Okay, so weak electrolyte dissolves partially. So strong electrolytes, strong acids, you need to have those memorized. Strong bases, got to have those memorized. Soluble ionic compounds. Weak electrolytes are weak acids and weak bases. So if it's not on your strong list of acids or bases, you're going to assume that it's weak. And non-electrolytes or anything else, in particular molecular compounds, or precipitates, things that are not soluble. So in writing a non um, chemical equation on the AP exam, they will always ask you for the net ionic exam. So you can write molecular, ionic, and net ionic. So to write a net ionic, I only show the species that are involved. I eliminate all the spectators. And in order to decide what gets ionized, I want to separate strong acids, strong bases, and soluble ionic compounds. OK. So let's take a look at how that actually works. So let's say I have silver nitrate. So I have silver nitrate plus potassium chloride. And I am mixing them so they're going to swap places and it will probably tell you that you're going to end up making a precipitate and because you know potassium is always soluble and nitrates are always soluble it must be this okay so now i need to separate into ions nitrates are always soluble so this is a soluble salt so i have ag plus plus no3 minus they're aqueous i'm not going to write it i have potassium chloride potassium salts are always soluble and then over here, I'm going to make silver chloride. This is not soluble, so I'm going to write it as a solid, and I don't break it into ions. And then I have K+, plus, and I have the nitrate, both of which are always soluble, right? Now I go in and I eliminate my spectators, and what I'm left with is Ag plus Cl gives me AgCl. So if I'm making a solid, you could start by just writing the solid that gets formed, and then write whatever ions are necessary to make that. And they've got to be balanced. And if you do not show the, ion, the charge here, they are not ions and you won't get the point. Okay, so we let's take a look at classifying each of the following as um, strong, weak, or non-electrolyte. Now, you, you don't have to have this memorized because they're not on the list of strong, but it does dissolve. So this would be a strong. This is a strong acid, so it's a strong electrolyte. This is a molecule, it's actually an alcohol, and some people will confuse this with a base. A, the base, a basic hydroxide, always is with a metal, sodium hydroxide, aluminum hydroxide, okay? When it's on a molecule, especially a carbon-containing molecule, it's an alcohol. It, it does not act like a base, and it does not act like an acid. This is just a molecule. Here is formic acid. You can generally recognize acids because they start off with an H. It's not on my strong list, so this is going to be a weak electrolyte. This molecule, by the way, is a non-electrolyte. It does not form ions if it's a molecule. This is on my strong list, so this is going to be a strong electrolyte. All right, so if I'm writing the net ionic equations for these, I'm going to have acetic acid, which I'll write as H. C2H3O2 and lithium hydroxide. And they're going to do a double replacement. And I'm going to end up with water and lithium acetate. So this is a weak acid, so I do not separate it. That's the one thing that people tend to do wrong is separate acetic acid. It's weak, it is mostly a molecule. Lithium salts doesn't matter whether it, or this is you can consider this a strong base plus the hydroxide water is a liquid it's a molecule it is not ions okay 
Lithium salts are always soluble. And then I'm going to have my acetate ion. Okay, so the only thing that is a spectator here is the lithium. So I'm going to end up with acetic acid plus hydroxide it gives me water and the acetate ion. Here I have a strong acid HCl plus NaOH. Okay, and I'm going to so I'm going to end up with water and NaCl. And so this is H plus plus Cl minus. That's strong. It completes completely dissociates. I've got to make sure I have the ion charges. It's going to give me H2O plus Na plus plus Cl minus. Na is a spectator, Cl is a spectator, and I am left with H plus plus OH minus gives me water. And this is the formula that is always the net ionic equation when I have a strong acid, strong base. Strong acid, strong base. If one of those is weak, it is not the net ionic, right? Because here I had a weak and I had to leave it as a molecule. Okay. Okay, so you know molarity is molarity is moles over liters. And when you're using this in stoic, you're going to be able to manipulate this equation. So if I want to know moles, it's going to be molarity times liters. Okay. If I want to know liters, it's going to be moles over molarity. All right. The brackets here mean molarity. Same thing. Okay. The molarity of AgNO3 equals 1.0 molar, for instance. Okay, if I'm preparing a solution, this question comes up a lot. How do I do this? You always want to say when you're preparing a solution is that you use a volumetric, this is not an Erlenmeyer, it's a volumetric flask, very precise piece of glassware. It has this single line that I fill up. So if I'm making 50 milliliters, I use a 50 milliliter flask. If I'm making 250 milliliters, I use a 250 milliliter flask, okay? I use it really just for making solutions, volumetric flask. Okay, so I can add my solid, mass up my solid. I'm making one liter of a one molar. So I have molarity is moles over liters moles is molarity times liters. If I have one molar, that means moles over liters times one liter, that's one mole, right? One mole of sodium chloride is 58.44 grams. I add that to the flask. Sometimes it's good practice to put some water down there first so it doesn't stick, but I don't think you'd lose points for not having that. You fill it up with water to a certain level, stir it up, and then as it's uh, done mixing, you want to raise the water level to that one liter mark, okay? And in doing so, you make sure that you have one liter of total solution. It's not one liter of water, it's one liter of total solution. So if I wanted to know how many grams of magnesium nitrate there are it to make required to make 500 milliliters of a 0.672 molar solution, Oh, so magnesium nitrate has a molar mass of 148, oops, 0.3 grams per well. grams per mole. Okay, so I'm making 500 milliliters of 0.672 molar. So I have 500 milliliters. And a thousand milliliters is one liter, and according to this, one liter is 0.672 moles. So I need half of this in moles, and so that's going to be 0.336 moles. That's how many moles of solute I'm going to need. So I multiply that times my molar mass, which is 148.3 and I get something like a 9.7 grams. And how precise you are here depends on whether you're doing a multiple choice or you're doing an FRQ. If you're doing an FRQ, let's just take a look at sig figs here because there will be one question where they'll take points off for sig figs and that one point might make the difference between a three or a four as a score or five, four or five. And I keep just messing up here. 
Um, so what I have here, 500 milliliters, because I have this decimal point here, this is three sig figs, this is three sig figs, so I want three sig figs in my answer. Okay, sometimes you get asked about concentration of ions, so if I have 3.21 grams of sodium phosphate, and that has a formula of Na3PO4, and it has a molar mass of 63.94 grams. So I can find how many moles that is by taking 3.21 grams divided by 63.94 grams per mole. And what I get is um, 0 0.050 moles. And so it's asking what is the um, and I'm making it up so that's to 800 milliliters. So the molarity of the solution is 0.05 moles divided by 0.8 liters. And so that's 0.0625 molar solution. But it's asking about what's the molarity of the sodium ions. And for every one mole of of this, I have three moles of Na plus. Okay, so I'm going to multiply this times three, which is about 0.186 or so, something like that. Depending again whether it's multiple choice or FRQ. If it's multiple choice, we're guesstimating. If we're FRQs, we're punching it into the calculator and calculating it. Okay. Alrighty. If I'm doing a dilution, lots of dilution uh, problems usually show up on the test in one form or another. Key thing to remember here is, is if I'm starting with a concentrated solution and I add water to dilute it, I have the same number of solute particles before and after. So I have the same number of moles of the concentrated equals my moles of my dilute. And because um, moles times liters equals mol molarity times liters is moles, we end up with the dilution formula of M1V1 equals M2V2. Okay, and it doesn't matter what the units of volume are as long as they're the same on both sides. Okay, if I'm preparing a dilution, I also use a volumetric flask. I want to be very precise, so I'm going to use this very piece, uh, precise piece of glassware. If I'm preparing three liters of a 0.5 molar calcium chloride from a stock solution, if I do my M1V1 equals M2V2, I have 10 molar stock solution. I have 0.15 liters of it. I want uh, 0.5 molar and 3 liters. Okay. So I was solving, initially you're going to solve for what's the volume of the stock solution. I call this stock solution, it's the stuff I have in my stock room that I, is concentrated that I can dilute. Okay, so if you wanted to find out what that volume was, you just rearrange this equation and be M2, V2 over M1. So you add that and then you fill it up to the line with water. Don't forget when you're doing stoic, that molarity is um, molarity times liters is moles. Okay, so you might get asked this way: What volume of 0.5 molar sodium sulfate will completely react with point with 500 milliliters of 0.2 molar um, barium chloride? And they will probably give you a formula because you don't have to write them too often. So I just want to make sure this is going to react at a one-to-one -one ratio. So let's, let's just check what we're going to get. Barium is a plus two, sulfate's a minus two, so I'm going to end up with two of those. But these will be one-to-one. -one. So um, what I'm going to have, if I'm doing an ICF table, is I'm going to have my barium chloride is going to be 0.5 liters times 0.2 molar. Okay. We need the same number of moles of this, and that's going to give a certain number of moles. But here I'm going to have 0.5 molar times some number of liters. So it's kind of obvious here, 0.5 times 0.2 is going to be equal to 0.5 times 0.2. But in case this case, 
the point 2 is the liters. Okay, or I could punch it into my calculators, but I need point 0.2 liters or 200 milliliters. All right, let's take a look at a couple quick questions. When iron nitrate dissolves in water, what particles are present in the solution? So I'm going to have Fe plus 2, and I know that because the nitrate is minus 1, which means that this uh, Fe must be a plus 2, and I'm going to have two nitrates. So sometimes you get asked about observable evidence, and here we have been given a reaction, and what you know is this is soluble, and this is soluble, and this is soluble, and this is not on our soluble list, so this is probably going to make a solid. And these are the kinds of things that will get you'll get asked about when you're talking about observable evidence. But here you are forming a solid or a precipitate, the lead iodide. Okay, here's another typical kind of question. If you have equal concentrations of the following aqueous solutions, which will have the highest conductivity? So let's assume that all these um, this calcium chloride is completely soluble. So every one mole of this. Well, one molar of this, I'm going to have three moles of ions. I'm going to have two moles of ions. One of these, two of those, three moles of ions. Three nitrates, one aluminum, it's four moles of ions. One mole, one mole of the acetate ion. That's a total of two moles of ions. So the one that has the most moles of ions is going to have the highest conductivity. So it'll be aluminum nitrate. Um, what are the spectators in the following reaction. So here I have K plus plus OH minus. This is weak. I leave it together. It is not separated into ions. K plus plus F minus. And I do not separate water. It's a molecule. So the only spectrator I have here is K plus. So we need to be K plus. All right, which would have the highest concentration of sodium plus? So if I have 0.35 molar of this, and there are two of these sodiums for every one of these, I'm going to have 0.35 times 2 here. I'm going to have 0.4 times 3 here. I'm going to have 0.5 times 1, 0.8 times 1, and 1 1.0. So 0.35 times 2 is 0.7. That's 1.2. So that's going to do it. It's going to have the highest concentration of sodium plus. All right, we're going to stop right there.